So everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm gonna ask a, a number of questions of, of all of you. Some of them will be specific and some of them will be general. And for some of those, I might just ask you to raise your hand. So first off, we are going into third year of this pandemic. <laughs> um, do all, have all of you gotten your vaccine at this point? Is there anyone unvaccinated on the call? Have all of your children been vaccinated? Well, can I see hands? Sorry. So, sorry, if your children are unvaccinated, can you raise your hand? Mine too. Do you plan to vaccinate your children if they're eligible? Can you raise your hand? So, is there anyone at this point who is not comfortable with where we are and how the CDC has explained the need to vaccinate your children? Kevin, can you explain that? It's very difficult to know what to believe when it comes out. Uh, it depends who says it, whether it's the CDC, the executive branch, legislative, it's difficult what to believe. And it goes all the way back to, you know, what two years ago, midway through the election where a lot of the politicizing occurred uh, and it still is occurring. So it, it, you really have to use your best judgment and decipher what you hear from one news outlet from another and to another and make your own assessment of what you feel might be the best decision. It, it's interesting the way you're describing this. Do you trust the CDC? To some extent. To some extent. Um, you, you just described political messaging, but for the health officials, are you putting them in that category? Will you listen to the CDC if they tell you the best thing to do to protect your child is to vaccinate them? I will listen. Um, however, well, let's, let's take uh, the latest uh, that, that's come out in the news recently on Pfizer, uh, recently applying for um, you know, vaccine for kids five and under, right? If the CDC says, yes, you need to vaccinate your child, this has been approved, that's an if. Would I listen to it right away? No. I, I would take the same approach that, that I took and that the rest of my family took to the vaccine. Well, I, we want to wait and see. We don't want our, uh, well, in my case, I don't want my child to be part of the initial group that gets it. I wanna see what happens to people who do wanna have their kids get it in case there's any type of adverse reactions that we need to be aware of. It's the same approach I took to myself. Are you, and Cal, Caleb, I know you have a young child as well, a three-year-old, as I understand. What's your view? Yeah, I mean, the second that he's able to get his vaccine, we're gonna get him in there. Um, I feel like, you know, with the wait and see approach, it, you know, it makes sense, like logically and kind of intuitively, but you know you got to know that you know they're not getting these emergency use author they author these emergency use use authorizations unless there's actually you know s substantial amounts of children who have been tested with the vaccine. So the way that I see it is the second that I can get my three year old in and get him vaccinated, uh, the better. And then he can start seeing his friends again, start playing with mm -hmm. other kids again, get a little bit more normalcy in his life. Is that how you feel as well, Kylie? Uh, yeah, um, I, we, <laughs> a few of the daycare moms and I have made a joke about like waiting in line for like a concert, <laughs> basically who's bringing the tent. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, it's been tested extensively. Um, the amounts, like they're pretty clear on the amounts of like that they're giving the kids and the difference between that and an adult dose. Um, Marcy has already had COVID. Um, just because, you know, Omicron kind of uh, hit us all. <laughs> is this your three-year-old? Yes, this is my three-year-old. Yeah, um, she's already had COVID. Um, she got, we all got COVID, um, even though we're all vaxxed and boosted. But I still want her to have that protection. I mean, I, and it's mostly about, at this point, um, a lot of it's about the long COVID risks. 
and like seeing and basically kind of like um, the difference between the chicken pox vaccine. Like I was too young for the chi- or I was too old for the chicken pox vaccine. I'd already had chicken pox, but that puts me at a greater risk for shingles as an adult. Marcy has had the chicken pox vaccine. It is very unlikely she will get say, shingles as an adult. So that's kind of how I feel about the COVID vaccine. Um, yes, she's had COVID, but still being able to get vaccinated, I think will help her in the long run for post viral uh, conditions. So that's really where I, I, I want her not only to have a little bit of normalcy, but I want her to be able to keep that and not develop a chronic condition at a young age. Can I see a show of hands at, at this point? Because I think this is what influences us all. Do you feel the pandemic is directly impacting you and the safety of your family right now? Show of hands. I'm su- <laughs> explain that, um, explain this to me. I think, is, is this Sydney? I think- Yes, Sydney. Yeah, Sydney yeah, and I, Pink. What, is, um, what does this mean? You, you're not sure if the, the pandemic is impacting you it, and your family? I mean, it depends on how much we're out of the house, you know? So I feel like my daughter did have, right, going the week before the holidays, she did get COVID. She was, she's a, she's a manager on the basketball team. And, and so the team they were playing against, it turned out some of the players had, it, and she had it, she was vaccinated. And I, I feel like she was asymptomatic because she had the vaccine. So our lives did change in that moment. And we do, you know, we do do things differently, but I don't feel the same level of unsafety that I felt at the beginning of the pandemic when Mm -hmm. there were no vaccines, um, when people were getting a lot more sick when they did get COVID and they were having longer symptoms, um, you know, reoccurring symptoms, even some of the the uh, mental wellness issues that have popped up. So Kevin, when you hear Sydney say that, you don't, for you, the psychological benefit, you don't see as a reason to vaccinate your, your children necessarily? Well, I mean, my son has had COVID. Uh, you know, he's been through, through it and it was pretty rough. Um, part of what I, I look at is at three years old, you got a child that can't communicate the same way, uh, you know, an older child can, you know, I, I know what else I felt like when I got the vaccine for a three-year-old to communicate what they really are feeling. And if there's a problem, can they actually do that? I, I don't think they can. That's part of the reason why we want to wait in addition to what I've said before. So as far as what uh, the question you asked there, um, you know, the psychological feeling of being a little bit more protected if, if my son received it? Uh, no, because we, we look at our lives a little bit differently. We, we make sure that we limit our points of exposure mm-hmm. as best as possible. Uh, we take all the precautions we possibly can, whether we're out uh, as a family or individually. And uh, but at, that, at this point, we're comfortable with that. Allison, I want you to jump in here because I think you've got a pretty interesting point of view. You are actually a pediatrician. So you hear, pe- you hear people talk to you about all of this all the time. And yet you are not vaccinating your children. Is that right? I, I do plan to. You do? Yeah, absolutely. Why haven't, you, why haven't you vaccinated your children yet? If you're a pediatrician, is there you know, what, how do you justify that in your mind? Well, my seven-year-old is the only one that would qualify at this point. And so we are dealing with having COVID and having natural immunity from that. So await, waiting the time period before the vaccine um, is able to be given. So that's coming up here in the near future. And I plan to give it at that time. So you, you will vaccinate your children and would Absolutely. you, so you will, you, you counsel your patients to t- your the parents of your patients to do so as well? You know, it's interesting. I discuss the science and the facts behind what we do know to be true about the vaccine and the data behind it with my families. Um, but I ultimately leave the decision to them. Uh, they're the parents. I don't believe that there's any parent in this world who is choosing to harm their child by the decision that they make about the vaccine. 
And so my job is to give them the information and then let them choose what they think is best for their own kid. Um, being a parent is hard enough and parenting through the pandemic is especially challenging. And then when you talk about giving a vaccine to your child where there's already so, so many hesitancies surrounding vaccines in general, and then a new vaccine, it's hard and I get it. And I really empathize with parents when they struggle to make this kind of decision. Cam, how, how about you? How have you fared and how have your children fared during this pandemic? So my son's 13. So, you know, uh, he started at a new school right when it started. So it was an entirely different experience for him. He didn't get to sort of make the connections and the interactions that he would at a new school. And then of course- your son, uh, your son's 13. You he's said. 13. Um, so a know, very social time. Very, very social time. And that's when kids are starting to form into those groups that you know possibly develop into lifelong friendships. And then coupled with that, he's very close to our family. So my parents are both in their 70s, so he couldn't spend time with them. You know, he was with me the majority of the time. He had some issues with it um, the first six months. And when they did go back to school, there was a little bit of a catch up factor for him because he's in a new school, they're new friends. It was just an entirely different experience than anyone could have possibly have imagined for him. And now he's back at school in seventh grade. I still think he's, you know, sort of playing catch up and trying to get back to some level of normalcy. Did the vaccine make a tremendous difference in, in his life or in your psychology? Like, well, did, you feel, did you feel uh, like a, a certain level of protection around him that there, you, as a parent? No, absolutely, because you always want to do anything you possibly can to protect your child. And unfortunately, I lost my best friend who opted to not get vaccinated prior to my son being able to get vaccinated. So as soon as it was an option for him to be able to get the vaccine, he was 12 when he got it, there wasn't any hesitation on my part. You know, It wasn't even an option. That's what we were going to do based on what had happened in our lives and how we had all been impacted. Alejandra, your children are a little bit older. So how did you have that communication about the need to get vaccinated? Were they excited about it? Were they pushing back on you as a parent? Like, what was your conversation about the need to get vaccinated or not? My kids are, <clears throat> my kids really are really prudent, verging on the hypochondriac. So they got <laughs> vaccinated as soon as they were eligible. I didn't have to push them at all anything they pushed me and I mean how did that make you feel as a parent it made me feel safer we were not given their ages I wasn't worried about them dying of COVID but I was worried about them having the flu from hell and then having any long-term consequences of that flu from hell so I felt a lot safer after they got the vaccine and dare I say that they became a lot less accepting in their social distancing, wearing of masks, and so on and so forth. So I view the vaccine not only as something that may save you from adverse health consequences, but as something that may help you live more freely. And I frankly resent the antivaxxers because they become a reservoir of the illness and they impose, I feel that antivirus are imposing all these COVID restrictions on us. And when you say uh, anti-vaxxers, you don't mean the unvaccinated necessarily. You mean people who are anti-vaccine. You're not blaming people who aren't eligible. I, I mean, I mean uh, people who spread lies and misinformation about COVID and its vaccines for yeah. either through political fanaticism or just plain old stupidity, inability mm -hmm. to weigh clear evidence. I want to ask a few basic questions and if you could raise your hand. Do all of you, do all of you and do all of your children wear masks? Raise your hand. And they all wear masks when they go to school. Are any of you, like, do any of you hope that they get to take off that mask soon? Or is it just normal now? Alejandro, you, oh, and, and you, Sydney. Uh, yes. Do, do you, 
I go ahead. At my my middle child is going to college, mm -hmm. and they at colleges they really have a nasty mental health crisis. It's not made up, and the COVID restrictions have a lot to do with that. So that's not masking necessarily. That's it's that's not, everything. Yes, it's masking the social distancing, the asking for the having to get tested twice a week and so on and so forth. It's really taxing and it's really affecting their social lives. It's driving some of them pretty crazy, I guess. The point we'll have to see how these restrictions impact things like the suicide rate. Sydney, what were you thinking when I asked that question? Um, I'm hoping that someday they can you know, sooner, as soon as possible, take the masks off. Um, they are very active, particularly my son who plays sports for school. He's got to play sports with the mask and it's not comfortable. Um, you know, even just watching them play makes me uncomfortable. And then socially not being able to have that ability to read emotions and to communicate emotions with your face. I just worry, not just for my kids, but for you know, the younger generations that they're already losing some of that in terms of being able to, to read emotions because of um, video games. Everything needs to be exaggerated anyway. And I think that wearing masks on top of that, they're, they're learning, they're not able to learn a bit of socialization at mm -hmm. a really critical stage. And will they be able to go back to that or not? I don't know, and we'll have to see, but it's something that I do worry about. And I, you know, I'd like them to be able to just use their faces <laughs> and, and, and experiences other people's faces to their you know, full beauty and everything. Um, you know, I have very young children and I know Kevin, um, teaching your child to wear a mask at first can be pretty challenging. I understand you had a hard time, Kevin, with your toddler and getting him to wear a mask. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we decided over the holidays, instead of to quarantine for a couple of weeks, uh, we did it for five weeks. Uh, and during that five week period, we were trying to get him uh, used to wearing a mask or just try it around the house like his mom and I were. And uh, no, it, it did not happen. <laughs> um, but uh, first day of, that he went back to school, you know, I asked his teachers, how, how well did he do with the mask? They said, no problem. He, he wore it the whole day. It's almost like he's in that environment. He sees other kids doing it, so he does it as well. You know, so that all that trying that we did at home was almost for nothing. But uh, yeah, so Peer yeah, pressure was. is real, even when you're a toddler. Apparently. <laughs> I know, isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Allison, you must see that uh, as a doctor as well. Are you concerned about uh, development with young children, given all the restrictions we're living under? Do you, do you think that's a valid worry from parents? I do, especially for our teenage children. I mean, um, they're at such an age where mental health issues are emerging and prominent as it is, and then you put the pandemic on top of it and feeling the isolation from a quarantine or from virtual learning or whatever it is, even just wearing masks like Sydney was talking about and not being able to see people's expressions and their faces or being isolated from their sports teams, whatever it is, um, we know we have the data behind it that it's really affecting our teenagers. As far as the little ones go, I am not quite so concerned because these little ones are so resilient. Um, and, you know, I think the ones who have some uh, maybe speech delay um, where they can't see the mouths, we've come up with such creative ways to get around the mask issue that um, as we go further along into this, we're developing more and more things that are helping us to adapt to this new normal. Um, so I think it's less of a concern than the big kids, but um, yeah, I think it's it's definitely an, an issue. I see it in my own, daughter with she's in first grade and in kindergarten she was wearing a mask all year and it wasn't an issue and at the beginning of this year they didn't have them wearing masks and she was thrilled of course and then with the upsurge and the new variant they had them return to masks and she just cried 
And um, it was so interesting to me because I didn't hear a complaint for an entire year from her. And then when we allowed them to go without for a period of time and had to return to it, she was devastated. Um, so it really brought it kind of in more perspective to me that, I mean, this, this is hard for them. It affects them so much more than we realize sometimes. A question to all of you, when you hear the term children are resilient, Allison just mentioned it, we've heard that term a lot. When you hear the term children are resilient, do you think that's a positive way of characterizing things or does it anger you a little bit? Show of hands if it angers you first. No. So when you hear children are resilient, all of you think that's a good thing. When all of you heard the, oh, sorry, a little bit of a delay there. Kylie, you're saying no. Um, it's not that I don't think children are resilient. Um, I just think sometimes there's such a focus on them being resilient and having grit that they don't get a chance to like actually feel their emotions because they're too busy shoving them down to show grit and resilience. And I mean, I don't think it's as much a problem with the with like the three year old set. I mean, they're all emotion all the time right now, and they just don't know how to, they don't know how to handle that um, yet. So they don't know how to push it down. Um, but when you start getting into elementary school age, um, I think there's been, we've kind of overcorrected on some things and like, you know, focusing on, they got to show this, this mysterious grit. And I, I feel like if I had had to do that in the first grade, um, I, probably would have had a, a harder time. Um, I mean, I did not need more assistance pushing my emotions to the side in order to do things. Um, I, yeah, I probably should have felt those a little bit more. <laughs> um, so I think it's not that I don't think that children are resilient or that we shouldn't, you know, because they are, they're, they're very young. Um, the very young, they don't have a lot of memories, but they do have, they, they, there are subconscious things that stick with them. Um, with the mask thing, I can totally see why um, a first grader would be upset because you finally gave them a privilege back and now you're yanking it away. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the most frustrating things about, um, about youngkin playing games with mask wearing because that's what it does. Like you tell a kid, okay, now you don't have to, and then you turn around, but you have to, and now you don't have to, and you have to. And um, I mean, Alexandria City Public Schools have kept masking in place the whole time. Like they've never pulled it back. So I don't think you're seeing you're seeing kids fight it because they haven't pulled it back yet. They haven't granted, you know, they haven't like put that privilege in place. So I I think I think we, especially now, I think we're all going to need to realize that our our kids aren't going to. They're, they're going to be slightly lacking in resilience after this. Like they're good, they're resilient, but they might be slightly lacking in, they, they're, they're feeling, they're going to need to feel their feelings and mm -hmm. we're going to need to give them the grace to do so. And I think that's, that's probably going to be the, the struggle going forward. That's a really, I think, important observation. Um, Cam, what's your feeling on this? Well, I mean, I, I agree that children are resilient, but I think the thing that is happening here, and, and not just unique to children, my nephew, for example, missed his senior year at Georgetown. So we have a generation of youth, uh, you know, that are missing opportunities and experiences that they're never going to be able to have again. Um, and we're facing something that all of us and generations before us have really not faced before. So what sort of baseline do we have to determine or you know, uh, compare what level of resiliency is? It, this mm -hmm. is a little different you know, saying that, oh, you didn't make the basketball team, you know, that's fine, you give it your best. I mean, we are just seeing and living in a time that none of us could have ever imagined. And the scary thing is, it doesn't seem like there's any end in sight. You know, and my son is just hitting his teenage years what are his teenage years going to be compared to what they typically should have been? It's, it's such a new norm, it, it, it's scary. Show of hands, who thinks that we can kind of make up for lost time? No one. 
who thinks we can repair whatever impact there has been to our children? Caleb, you're hopeful here. Yeah, I am. Because with my <clears throat> with my three year old, uh, we went to, uh, to visit family and friends during the holidays. And we hung out with some friends who we knew that were equally, uh, you know, cautious uh, with COVID precautions as we were. And my three year old, he just bounced back right into playing with their kids. And, you know, like, it's, it's different. And it's hard, because like, this is a new thing that, that none of us have ever had to go through. But I think this is just normative for them moving forward. So they won't know that it's not like the same as what we had. So it almost feels like, um, like the rest, the restoration of normal for us isn't really even something that we can ever get to because it's their normal now and they don't even really remember our normal, at least for the little mm -hmm. ones. And so I think that moving forward, we can definitely, you know, change and improve things and, and make new, new policy procedures to, to, to mitigate things like this in the future. Um, but for them, that will be always part of the, of the way that they see the world is, yeah, there's pandemics that can happen. Uh, this is just what we lived through, if that makes sense. It does. I mean, if you pick up a parenting manual, they tell you it's about schedule. It's about predictability. And none of us have had much predictable recently. Um, and I know certainly, Sydney, I, I know your children have experienced things with kind of a stop start with being able to go to school or go to sports practice. Um, how has that impacted them? Um, so initially when everything shut down and school was 100% remote, sports had stopped, dance class had stopped. It was, you know, it was really hard as you would expect. Um, not only did they have to learn how to be safe and uh, be responsible for other people's safety, they also had to learn how to function in school. Like what did their executive functioning skills look like? That was a totally different thing. Um, you know, I guess at the time they were 12 and 14, that's a really crucial time. That was seventh grade and ninth grade. They got half of that. Um, you know, so for my daughter who is a little bit more quiet anyway, it, we had to make sure she came out of her room. Like you have to walk the dog as far as you can just to get out of your room, just to get some fresh air. My son, um, and we could kind of see her closing down, tensing up and, you know, so we could go into how can we help her mode. My son is a little bit more, you know, he's the younger one. He's a little bit more happy-go-lucky. And so he seemed to be taking everything in stride. He liked having the opportunity to take naps to eat what he wanted when he could. Um, but he, like, we still had to check on him to make sure his lights were turned on during the Zoom. He was sitting up during the Zoom. And like I said, it seemed like he was taking everything into stride until it was clear he wasn't. Like, he was a 12-year-old who had, like, a three-year-old meltdown one day. And we were like, you know, this is really affecting him. And so, like, how do you figure out how to help him when we don't really know how we don't know how it's affecting him because he just he was fine and then he had a meltdown and he just ran out of the house yelling you know it and it was a you know we were worried um and so we did one of the things that we did at the time was we gave them their school has trimesters we gave them a day off or i gave them a day off um one per trimester if they weren't sick if they didn't have to miss school just to have a mental break and we've done that again now like when my daughter had COVID she missed a week so you don't need mm -hmm. a mental break day because you're kind of behind and you need to catch up but if you really need a day just to say I need a break from the way things are right now then let's talk about that and and you know that for me is an option just to keep them mentally mentally um healthy then the other then when we go back you know again my son wasn't excited about going back he liked staying home and being in charge of himself and his schedule even though he's really a social guy 
he missed sports. So he was happy about that. But my daughter was so happy. Now she's 16. So she's so happy to, you know, go back and be social. She feels she learns better in a one on, you know, when she's in person with the teacher. So, you know, having two kids, we had two very different experiences for each of them. And, and Cam, I know um, you had some difficulty seeing that, what the impact was of isolation on your son. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, he, you know, he had um, a couple moments where one, he probably a couple months into it, he was just breaking down occasionally. And he finally wrote me a letter and said that he was concerned about when I wasn't going to be around, which was shocking. And because you see all this like death and gloom all around you, we were basically holed up in the house. We hadn't seen our family in months. Um, and then of course, just not being able to socialize. So it, it, it's been much better now that he's back at school, but that first six to nine months, it definitely affected him emotionally. That must've been really hard to hear as a parent. Oh, absolutely. That's, you, you know, I spoke to friends about it and they're like, yeah, no, and it's normal. Kids have these thoughts, but I spoke to him and he's, he said the primary driver for him was seeing what was happening to everyone around us. He was concerned that my parents, for example, you know, were, were getting older and he saw all the news reports that said that it affected the elderly a lot more than it did, mm -hmm. you know, others and kids were, you know, more resilient apparently. So it was information overload, I think, that led to a lot of that. And, and Alejandro, your children were older going through all of this, but they were going through some pretty big milestones with graduations and, and the like. I mean, do you feel like that is a regret that they have, that they weren't able to have what is a normal graduation period, for example? Depends on the kids' personalities. My middle... Uh... Miss, well, she did have her high school graduation despite COVID at a time in which the restrictions were being lowered a bit. So everyone was masked and social distance, but they did have their graduation. It, it depends on the personality of the kids, really. My extroverted middle kid, I don't think has been much affected. My youngest kid, has been affected quite a bit more. How so? <clears throat> by, for a long while, by not being able to meet his friends or by not being able to meet them without masks, <laughs> really. Mm -hmm. Mask wearing gets old and it gets old pretty fast. And there's another thing as well. Uh, we haven't taken a vacation since COVID began. And that's not only because of health issues, but also because of the general disruption that COVID has introduced. So, I mean, you could go to your dream vacation destination and then something happens and not be able to get back. Right. Your, your fear of changing regulations and the lack of predictability, that's yes. been the big impact. Or even fear of getting COVID at uh, at an Airbnb on the other side of the country or even worse overseas. Mm -hmm. Or just, yes, a new variant showing up and not being able to return or not being able to return without a long quarantine. Can I see a show of hands? Because I think across the board and I'm, you're from all over the country and you're from different political parties and different points of view, but all of you are worried about your kids. That's natural. But I wonder how many of you worry about yourselves here. Are you concerned as parents that you are projecting onto your children some of your own anxiety? Do you think about that? None of you do. Do all of you feel like your emotional health has been impacted by COVID? Show of hands. All of you do. Do you think that impacts your ability to parent? Show of hands.
do you, all of you, it, it's interesting because in, for some people, the vaccine is the gateway to normal. But from what I'm hearing from all of you is, and, and those of you who have had children who are vaccinated, it is like this normal isn't very comfortable for anyone. Absence of restrictions is the gateway to normal. The it absence was before, of restrictions. Yeah, it was before Omicron too. Um, because I got vaxxed and boosted and we were starting to do things and kind of see, even though she hadn't been vaccinated yet, we have a really good bubble. Everybody has been vaxxed and boosted, you know, and that's the thing that the CDC kept saying, that's, that's how you protect your child is you make sure everybody around them is vaxxed and boosted because neither of my kids' grandmothers will get vaccinated. Um, so they haven't seen her since she was a year old. So she's been wow. two years that's their own problem but you know so they haven't seen they haven't seen her but that's so not an easy choice for you as a parent it, it isn't it was a, it, it was a hard conversation to have with my own mother I must say but the um so so we you know we've done the protective thing and then there came Omicron and it didn't seem to matter that we were vaccinated and boosted it was coming for you anyway and so now that's part of the paranoia almost right now Yes, I'm going to get Marcy vaccinated as soon as possible, but now I don't think of the vaccine as the way out anymore. So that's why the White House's let's get everybody vaccinated has been so frustrating because A, I can't get her vaccinated. She didn't qualify yet. And B, I was vaccinated and boosted and I still got COVID. And so now I have to worry about health problems that I may not have had until I was in my 60s. So that's it, Omicron has kind of changed my view of whether the vaccination is the key to getting out of all of this. We have to, everyone has to combine it with the other precautions to, again, like they were saying at the very beginning, flatten the curve. And mm -hmm. that's the most frustrating part of like the anti-vaxxer, you know, people who refuse to get vaccinated, you know, that kind of thing. Like that's the most frustrating part. So when you heard the White House, the Biden administration say this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated, you didn't hear anti-vaxxer. You heard that as a reference to your own child. You heard that as a warning yes. to the health of your own child. I, when, when that statement was released, I actually had a slight breakdown. Um, and this is why the mental health thing, like I... I almost had like a panic attack because even though like, yes, I know what he was probably talking about. He's probably referring to people who refuse to get vaccinated for whatever reason, but it's, <laughs> I still can't get my kid vaccinated. She's still unvaccinated. So that still means something to me when somebody is saying, well, I guess if they're unvaccinated, then they're just going to, to die. <laughs> so I, I absolutely lost it. And I had to try to stuff that back in. I had to stuff that back in. I had to paste a smile on my face. I had to, you know, I had to be okay for my kid. And I wasn't inside. And I'm a bit bitter about that <laughs> um, when it comes to as far and and my poly, I mean, I voted for Biden. I I wanted Elizabeth Warren, but he was a candidate. I voted for him. And this is what this is what we've gotten. Um so that's that's yeah, that's made it a little hard. Mm -hmm. Kevin, when you heard that statement, how did you feel? I think I you're my, there we go. I'm unmuted now. Uh, I rolled my eyes, didn't I? <laughs> I think I did. Um no, I, I just felt a little frustrated because, um, you know, I don't think there at this point there really is a way out. Um, and but I also think the vaccine and all the rhetoric out there was made to made us feel like it was the way out. But at the speed in which um, the variants would pop up, it almost made the vaccine the last hope. But then all of a sudden Omicron came around and it like like uh, like Hailey said that it really didn't make a difference if you were vaxxed or boosted. Um, 
Um, well, it made a difference in outcomes, but it didn't stop you from getting sick. Correct. Yes. Did right. you feel like you'd been, you know, do, do you feel, and I'm trying to think how to say this in a non-loaded way. When, <laughs> do, do you feel like you didn't get a fair description of what the vaccine was supposed to do for you? Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. To some extent, I, I think so. But I also think that there were a lot of unknowns. So I think we got the best description as possible at the time that they initially came out. You know, but I feel like uh, all of the, the marketing around the vaccine releases was just completely mishandled. We were sold, you know, that vaccines were going to solve everything as soon as we got them. And that's just never how vaccines have worked. Like. Like you get, you can get the flu after you get a flu shot. Uh, you can get chicken pox after you get the chicken pox shot. And I think that we forgot that like, yeah, even if we get uh, herd immunity through vaccination, people can still get it. And so I think that the whole, uh, you know, political rollout of vaccination uh, uh, around the whole country was really just kind of mishandled because it did promise something that we all should have known was not going to be the be all end all. Allison, you're a doctor. When you heard this, did you feel like the public was being over promised something? I don't think so. I think part of the issue is, is it's just human nature when you're in the pit of despair from whatever is going on that you hold on to any sort of source of hope that you have. And so when the vaccine started coming out, I. I think people just were hoping that that was going to be what saved us from this and would give us our normalcy back. And it hasn't. And I don't think that that's necessarily the fault of the vaccine producers. Um, I think it's just it's just the way that, back, as Caleb said, vaccines work um, in some of these situations. And I think that when going back to when you were talking about this being so challenging as a parent, I think that's the hardest part is as a parent, we are constantly wanting to reassure our kids that things are going to be okay. Um, in this situation, the normalcy is going to return at some point. And I don't know that any of us can say that that's on the horizon. Um, and it's hard. It's hard um, when, you know, at my kids' ages, like I said, we reassure them a lot. And the other thing is we can distract them with you know, what the next best thing is going to be. And I don't, I don't know what that is for my kids. I don't know that I can promise that the play dates we used to have are going to return in the same way or the field trips um, or, you know, any, anything going into spur of the moment, going to visit friends or family, whatever it is, that still is not better. And I don't know that it's ever going to be. And that's really hard as a parent to try and walk your child through. Yeah. And also it's hard to figure out, we're learning how to parent in that new situation. Like all of the models that we had, we're looking at colleges now, we can't go visit necessarily. So how do you make a determination? Um, tests, our tests, you know, SAT tests and college admission tests are test optional. That sounds lovely. It sounds like you don't have to, admit you know you don't have to take the test or you don't have to have, have good scores or you if you don't have good scores you don't need to show them but then you need to have good grades okay fine but if you were so depressed that you couldn't show up for class and now you don't have the good grades and then they're looking at other things like um service but how do you figure out how to do the service when you can't be around people so it, it's you know just just building on what allison said it's learning how to parent afresh, anew, not that we expected it to be the same as when we were young. We know times change and they're changing faster and faster, but there is no blueprint. Everybody's trying to figure it out and not just the parents, but the thing, you know, the institutions are trying to figure it out, the schools are trying to figure it out, the jobs are trying to figure it out, the colleges are trying to figure it out, nobody knows. And so, you know, you do the best you can and you hope that it will work out in the end. You just don't know. There's so much that, that all of you have laid out here and it's kind of hard to put a label on any part of it, but how many of you feel angry? How many of you feel depressed? 
how many of you feel like the pandemic has put depression in your life in some way, either through family member, through kids? How many of you have experienced that? Do you all feel like we're living through a national trauma? Is that overstating things or is that how you feel? Do you all feel kind of traumatized? Kevin, you're, you're giving me a little of this. What is this? No, I was just thinking about uh, the question <laughs> because every day is a challenge, right? Um, I, I, I check the news pretty much every other day. I, I can't watch it every day because it's always the same thing uh, when it comes to, to COVID. But when I see an article or, or a politician or even one some of the highest members of our government say that we need to learn to live with COVID, as a parent, to me, that just, that raises the hair on my neck <laughs> because that to me says that the vaccine did not work in a sense of giving us an, a full out to resolving this pandemic and that the people that really should be fighting to fix this are not fighting to fix it and get rid of it. They're and who are those people? Our, our elected officials. Are you talking about the federal government, the state government, the local government? Like who, when, when you have frustration and anger, yeah. it's almost hard to direct it at anyone these days. Like, well, who who yeah, are you so, talking about? Yeah, I read a lot of stories in, in, uh, about uh, federal government officials. You know, how many times have any of us picked up paper, if we pick up paper anymore, <laughs> or, uh, or go to one of our, our news sites to see a member of the Biden administration talks about living with COVID, learning to live with it. I find that just despicable. Did you we're, feel we're, that way? Did you feel that way through the past administration in the beginning of this as well? I think I, I did to a certain extent. And I did have some hope as the previous administration um, pushed forward with developing these vaccines. Um, I did. And just over the past year, I sort of lost that hope. Mm -hmm. It's, it's quite frustrating to me when I, when I hear a member of, of the Biden administration talk about trying to live with COVID. We're a country that had a huge involvement with getting rid of polio. I mean, that's a huge, huge accomplishment. Why don't we have that mentality to go ahead and tackle COVID? Why? We should not accept dealing with it. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how I view it. So as a parent, you know, trying to live with it with a three-year-old <laughs> and just live through it as they get to four, five, six. I, I hope we don't have to do that. I really don't. You're impatient. Very impatient. It, it's been, what, two, three years. We're going on three years now. Mm -hmm. You know, there has to be an end in sight. Well, and hearing that, hearing that kind of rhetoric from people who, A, don't have kids because, you know, they're all well into their 70s at this point if you look at the demographics um and then you have they they don't they don't have kids they all have very excellent health care they live in very nice large houses with big yards and lots of places to go with vacation houses that they can just take off to whenever they need a break and i mean heck they don't stay in congress all year they get huge breaks they get to go on vacation i had to work with COVID and my toddler home with COVID while the daycare was closed and my husband had COVID and we were all in this house that is 1100 square feet with a tiny lot and it's freezing outside. Of course, this was weather. So we were stuck in a house for two weeks together while I had to work the whole time while sick because nobody decided to re-up the FFCRA leave so nobody had to give me any COVID sick leave. I had to use what I got. And basically those basic measures, just basic stuff that they could absolutely do at any time. If Trump can pass that, I do not know why Biden cannot. Um, so I, that's the part that's the most frustrating is they are absolutely doing nothing else. If the vaccines don't work, they're not willing to do anything else. And now on the state level, we have a state governor in Virginia who is pulling back all of our COVID restrictions 
Like he's trying to make sure we don't have anything that we just go out willy nilly and live with COVID. And, you know, as somebody whose kids go to a private school that is currently virtual and when it's not, they are forced to mask, pulling back all of that stuff in our state. And it just, I, I rage. <laughs> like, I don't even know how to articulate it. I am constantly angry, just constantly angry. And I don't know what to do with that. And that is the part that I think will affect my parenting because, you know, it's not that I'm taking it out on my kiddo. I, you know, it's that, it's that I have to try to deal with that and I have to try to and focus on that. And I don't have any room to breathe. So that is, that is the problem. To, to kind of build off that during the election, there was so much rhetoric from the Democratic Party that that Biden was going to be another FDR, that we we're going to have a new deal, that we were going to tackle all of these big problems that we have and that are existential crises, uh, be it, you know, COVID, be it uh, climate change, everything. And we we're promised a, a, a new deal, uh, essentially. And, and, and they've just kind of failed to deliver on things and they can't even get Build Back Better passed. Um, and they're not actually like putting pressure on cinnamon and mansion to to actually like do these things that would materially help the american people the american worker people who have been struggling for two years and we just keep doing the same things and saying the same things and not showing up to congress half the time and then here we are at another election year where they'll have done nothing and and like the the two parties just we've got one who says i'm not going to do anything the Democrats then say, okay, well, let's try to do something. Oh, we didn't do it. Okay, we'll still vote for us. So that way they don't get to do nothing. And it's just like, well, <laughs> what? Give me, give me a reason to actually vote for you the next time around. Well, I'm going to go on a little bit different tangent here, but I, I'm an immigration attorney, so I pay a lot of interest to what's going on worldwide. And I think this problem is not like unique to the United States. It's it's a worldwide pandemic, so it's not like any political party can change what's going on. This this problem that we're facing is being faced all over the world. So it's, it, you know, I was no fan of Trump. I'm not exactly a fan of Biden, but it's not like any political party is not doing anything within their power to try and get us out of this. And again, it's it's not unique to the United States. It's It's worldwide. No, it is shaping the world that all of your children will grow up in. Absolutely. Um, Alejandro and um, Sydney and, and Allison, I'd like to get some final thoughts from the three of you as well. I still believe that there's a difference in infection rates, both within the US and comparing the US to other countries. And a lot of that difference in infection rates and lethality rates and, and the necessary restrictions thereof comes from the great unvaccinated mass. And the fact that we have such a high percentage, such an abnormally high percentage of unvaccinated people, it's because one political party has been outright spreading lies about the effectiveness of vaccines. Yes, there are some people who got COVID because even though they were vaccinated, but the rate at which they get COVID is like 10 times less the severity of the COVID symptoms is a lot lower as well. So that, well, I, I hate living with restrictions. I hate wearing a mask. I hate that my parents in their 80s cannot come visit. And I have to thank some people for that. Sydney and Allison. Um, I'll say for me, just in terms of parenting, it's been important to also really exploit the good things and the positive things, whether they're related to COVID or not. So, you know, with COVID, we we learned to cook new recipes together. And so my kids can cook meals um, that they couldn't cook before. My son taught me how to shoot basketball and not be embarrassed because <laughs> I'm missing <laughs> or my form is funny. Um, you know, my daughter and I went on really long walks and we started exploring all the nature paths that are in the area. And so we, um, you know, that's something we continue to do. And uh, we all got a lot fitter and, and ate better because we had time to concentrate on that. So we try 
that, like that's the only way through for us is there's so much stress there's so much to be depressed about but we really gotta take the good things exploit them and you know hold on to them to the best we can again I have a 16 year old daughter she's not hanging out at parties that's one stressor I don't have it might not be great for her social development but right now you know we don't have to worry about her who who is she out with and what is she doing <laughs> that's a, that's a good way for you to think about it as a parent um Allison uh, some final thoughts from you yeah I think um you know even if the thought is we just have to learn to live with COVID because we don't know what how the world's going to look in the future. I think it's still important to understand that we can grieve what's been lost through this process. And when you talk about depression and anger and frustration, um, for us personally, for me, just the day-to-day -day stuff has been difficult. Like, um, I'm, a, I'm a big hugger. So not knowing when I'm allowed to hug someone or not, and what their personal feelings are going to be if I get in their space, um, or are they vaccinated or not? Um, when it comes to my patients, it's so difficult with these little ones to wear masks. And one of the great joys of my job was to be able to share in the giggles and the smiles on these kids' faces and to not have that anymore um, or for it to not be reciprocated because I have my mask on is, it's, it's sad and it's hard for me um, to think that that's going to be our normal for forever. And um, if it is, so be it. That doesn't mean that I can't be really sad about not being able to share my smile or my hugs with my patients. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna thank all of you for your time tonight. Um, you're an extraordinary group. And I feel like, I feel like we all needed to kind of have this conversation, frankly. <laughs> um, it's been a really tough year, two years, going on three years. Um, so thank you all for sharing the stories of your families. I appreciate that.